Look, as a Warramai man from the Port Stephens region of New South Wales, I begin also by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we gather here today and also pay my respects to Elders both past and present. But I'm here today to talk about Aboriginal political activism and my work across the past three decades has sought to reveal previously missing narratives about Aboriginal political, social and race relations history. In doing so, providing a platform for people, both black and white, to learn from the past. Everything I do reflects the influence of this man, my grandfather. Fred Maynard, pictured there with his sister Emma at the Rocks in 1927, at the height of his political activity. And the organisation he formed, the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association, formed here in Sydney in 1924. Um, and um, as I said, that was at the Rocks in 1927, at the height of his... Um, and his sister, Emma. Uncovering this history all started for me with my late father wanting me to undertake a family history project and put my grandfather's story together. I was out of work at the age of 39 and had never previously set foot in a university. Now, I do not carry any fond memories of my school years. I started in 1959 and I left in 1969. I left in year nine. I left the day I turned 15 because that's when you could leave. And bang, I was out the gate as fast as I could. <laughs> For me, there was no support or encouragement in that space. There was nothing about Aboriginal culture or history in the school texts of that time. There was nothing to inspire a young Aboriginal boy. We were variously described in these books as a dying race and belonging to the Stone Age. And as I said, I left school the day I turned 15. I spent the next 25 years in a variety of jobs, none even remotely related to academia. Fortunately, I always had a great love of reading and an interest in history. I wanted to know what the hell had happened in the past, particularly to us, and try and figure that out. Taking on the family history project on my grandfather led me to Wallatooka, the Aboriginal Education Centre at the University of Newcastle. Now I knew to undertake research I would go to the libraries, the archives, little historical societies, but I thought Wallatooka was the Aboriginal Education Centre at the University, I'll go and ask them also for some ideas of areas that I could explore. And the director of Wallatooka in those days was Tracy Bunder, a Murray Aboriginal woman from up in Queensland, we had the briefest of conversations and by the time I'd turned around I'd been kidnapped and enrolled into a diploma course <laughs> which ran for two years. Um, and it was so different to my school years. I mean, it, it was just so relevant. I was like, I took to that like a duck to water. I did the diploma in two years, I did a BA in two years and I did a PhD in under three years. The PhD continued my family history project and was focused on my grandfather's story and the, the movement that he started. The driver for my work remains in inspiring our young people. As a historian, that means filling the gaps in the large, largely fragmented jigsaw puzzle of our history since 1788. I set out to write history that was largely unknown or has rarely been examined. I wanted to provide our people with the knowledge that they had heroes and heroines of their own in the past, largely missed by Australian history. I have from the outset not targeted academia with my work, but write intentionally for Aboriginal people and communities. I wanted our people to be able to read my work, enjoy it and gain inspiration from it. That I have been widely published through academia is a bonus that I never intentionally sought. I've also been driven to provide history for wider Australia that delivers a more balanced understanding of our past. All of my studies, as I said, continued the focus on my family history project on my grandfather. The history of the organisation, the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association, the AAPA, was a truth denied to this country for over six decades. It still amazes me that the history and memory of these Aboriginal rights campaigners was allowed to disappear from the historical record and to a great extent memory. The AAPA formed in Sydney in 1924 and would hold four annual conferences and they fought a bitter campaign, a five-year campaign against the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board. 
the state government's Aborigines Protection Board before being hounded out of existence by police acting for the board. And it's important to understand that the chairman of the, Australia, the Aborigines Protection Board in New South Wales was also the police commissioner at that time. There would be a number of international connections and influences on my grandfather's political thinking. He had travelled widely as a young man, working as a stockman, a timber getter, prospector, photographer, and he had witnessed the shocking conditions and hardships that Aboriginal people suffered under. In the first decades of the 20th century, he was working here in Sydney as a wharfie on the Sydney waterfront. It was a frightening place of work. The men were exploited and forced to fight for their positions on the dock. This was the Hungry Mile, uh, as the docks were known. It was here that my grandfather's political edge and voice was forged and connections to international black influence and inspiration. Probably the first really significant one was an organisation called the Coloured Progressive Association pictured here in 1907 holding a farewell to Jack Johnson, the first black heavyweight boxing champion of the world. Johnson had always been denied the chance of fighting for the world heavyweight title. They drew the colour bar and would not allow a black man to fight for the world title. Johnson continued to ch chase the, the white champions around the world and trying to goad them into fighting him. In the first instance in 1907, he came here and he had three fights and he knocked out all the, all the opponents. The Coloured Progressive Association, interestingly enough, formed in Sydney in 1903 and ran to 1919. Primarily made up of visiting African Americans, West Indians, Africans, Islanders, Maoris, but some Aboriginal people also. And that's my grandfather sitting there as a wharf labourer. <coughs> And there are other Aboriginal um, uh, people at that particular gathering to farewell Johnston. Johnson was like the Muhammad Ali of his day. Extremely outspoken, highly politicised, highly articulate, as well as being the greatest boxer on the planet. He came back to Australia in 1908 chasing Tommy Burns, who was then the world champion. And there was a press conference in Sydney um, Burns was there, as was Johnson, and there was a um, entrepreneur in Sydney, Hugh D. McIntosh. His nickname was Huge Deal McIntosh. And he, in the audience, put up his hand. The questions were asked of Burns. And he said, what would it take you to fight Jack Johnson? Jack's in the audience here. And even the King of England, just recently prior to this, had said to um, um, uh, Burns, why don't you fight Jack Johnson? You know, what's stopping you to fight Jack Johnson? That's when he got on a boat and went to Australia. Um, but when he was asked this by McIntosh, he just come up with a figure, 6,750 pounds. That would equate today to tens of millions of pounds. It was an unthinkable amount of money that certainly Burns thought no one would put that money up. With that he banged his hand down on the table, UD McIntosh, and said, done. <laughs> and that was at a press conference, as I say. He built the Sydney Stadium at Rushcutters Bay. 20,000 people were inside, 40,000 people were outside, and Jack Johnson completely destroyed Tommy Burns in the ring. All the racism, the prejudice, and the oppression that he had faced in his own family and what he'd seen around the globe he took out on Burns and it was like a cat playing with the mouse. The police had to jump into the ring in the 14th round to stop the fight. The punishment was so severe. But as far as Aboriginal people are concerned, you know, people like my grandfather being in the company of someone like Johnson at that time, incredibly inspirational. And that continued again through the docks. And my grandfather was coming into contact with African Americans was Tom Lacey, another Aboriginal activist at the time, were coming into contact with merchant black sailors. The white Australia policy was in. And when black merchant sailors were coming off ships, there was no red carpet rolled out to them and they felt that racism on the streets of Australia. But they spotted black dock workers. They gravitated towards them and that's the people they associated with. Through that process, my grandfather and others 
had manifestos and black newspapers from the United States, including Marcus Garvey, who established the biggest black movement ever seen in the United States, influenced people like Gandhi, Mandela, um, even Ho Chi Minh was a merchant sailor who attended Garvey's meetings in New York in the mid-1920s. So my grandfather again was getting these manifestos and newspapers of what was going on globally. And he suddenly realised that what we were facing here wasn't just a localised thing with racism, prejudice and oppression. It was a global thing and we needed to look at it that way and open up these contexts. First off, there was a chapter of Garvey's organisation set up right here in Sydney that was operational between 1920 and 1924. And then it faded from view. And that coincided with the rise of the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association when my grandfather's movement came into being. They probably felt that they needed to focus on themselves more than anything else. Now, one thing that hasn't been looked upon, certainly in New South Wales we're talking about, was the incredible farming success that Aboriginal people had from the 1850s right through to about 1910 in New South Wales. And Aboriginal people, and I've been through all the archives and seen the letters from Aboriginal people or their supporters writing to the state government and what was then formed the Aborigines Protection Board in 1883, asking for land for Aboriginal people in their own country. It was Dungutty people asking for land in Dungutty land, you know, 20, 30, 40 acres of land in Waramai country, Darkenjun country. People were writing these letters and there were letters of support. Some Aboriginal people, as I said, self-educated, were writing their own letters and others were getting support from uh, non-Indigenous supporters. Anyway, what you, again, the letters I've seen in the archives the government, first off, before the board was established, would contact the local police officer. Look, some Aboriginal people are sending letters in and petitions asking for some land. Say it might have been at Kempsey or it might have been at Port Macquarie or it might have been at um, Coffs Harbour up the coast. Police officer would go out and look at the land and then send a letter back to the board. These are all in the New South Wales State Archives. An example, it's 40 acres of heavily timbered worthless scrub. Give it to them. <laughs> Twelve months later, the same police officer has gone out to inspect. The land's all been cleared. It's been fenced. They've built a homestead. They've got uh, maize crops growing. They've got livestock. The records again in the archives highlight Aboriginal people clearing 100, 200, 300, 500 pounds. That's a lot of money at that particular point in time. Aboriginal people were prospering. We had regained in New South Wales some 27,000 acres of land and were working that land successfully. The tragedy of all of that was to come in 1910. The Aborigines Protection Board was beginning to have letters come in to them from non-Indigenous people demanding this land be handed over to them move the blacks out somewhere out further. They shouldn't be on this good land, you know. This was, as I said, four and five decades of work, of success, not recognised, and then Aboriginal people were thrown off. And again, the record's there. Police sent out, and at the point of a gun, Aboriginal people were thrown off with nothing more than the shirts they carried on their backs after five decades of work. An absolute tragedy. Um, that that's what happened. You can see the rise in the revoking of those um, Aboriginal reserve lands. Now that was the catalyst for the rise of the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association. This massive loss of land triggered a response in Aboriginal people to demand justice and to get their land returned. There was also the additional thing now that the Protection Board had really upped the ante of trying to break down Aboriginal culture and the community by removing Aboriginal kids from their families. And this really escalated. So this was the two catalysts for the formation of the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association in 1924. Their first conference was held at um, St David's Church and Hall in Surrey Hills. And my grandfather's inaugural address was covered in the Sydney newspapers. 
And this is what he said. Brothers and sisters, we have much business to transact, so let's get right down to it. We aim at the spiritual, the political, the industrial and social. We want to work out our own destiny. Our people have not had the courage to stand together in the past, but now we are united and are determined to work for the preservation for all of those interests which are near and dear to us. This is 1925. These were articulate, intelligent uh, Aboriginal activists at that particular point in time, working on the docks, working on the railways. They held another conference, same year, 1925, which was here in Kempsey. It ran over three days. And this amazes me that this event is missed historically. There's a lot of attention goes to the day of mourning. There were 100 people at the day of mourning, probably one of the most significant moments in Aboriginal political history. This event at Kempsey in 1925 ran over three days. The Maclay Argus and the Maclay Chronicle, the two newspapers, said over 700 Aboriginal people attended that conference. All the papers were written and delivered by Aboriginal people. Some were even delivered in Aboriginal language. And this is a point in time where they're saying Aboriginal culture was dead. You know, it was gone in southeastern Australia. Didn't exist. Here we have people delivering in language the importance of what was happening to Aboriginal people. As I said, um, three days, an incredible conference. At the close of that conference, my grandfather delivered a powerful resolution that was sent to the New South Wales State Government and also the Commonwealth Government. Here it is. As it is the proud boast of Australia that every person born beneath the Southern Cross is born free, irrespective of origin, race, colour, creed, religion or any other impediment, we, the representatives of the original people in conference assembled, demand that we shall be accorded the same full rights and privileges of citizenship as are enjoyed by all other sections of the community. And as I said, that was Kempsey in 1925. In 1927, the AAPA put out a manifesto. Now, this was also said to state and Commonwealth governments. Over years of research in this, I probably found four references to this going through and looking at old newspapers and microfiche. Now with the amazing trove, the uh, National Library's search engine, I found hundreds of references to this. It was probably published in every town in New South Wales, as well as Queensland, Victoria and even South Australia. Now you can see the thing there that um, the AAPA put up I guess what would be termed a land rights agenda. They demanded enough land for each and every Aboriginal family in the country. This was the first time it was being put up. That was part of the demand back in 1925. And it covers, it is covered here that all capable Aboriginals shall be given in fee simple good land to maintain a family. That the family life of Aboriginal people shall be held sacred and free from invasion, that the children shall be left in the control of their parents to stop the stolen generations and the tearing away of Aboriginal kids from their families. That the incapables of the Aboriginal community are the direct liability of the government consequent upon neglect of the past, be properly cared for in suitable homes or reserves, the full expense of such establishment to be borne by the government. That the supervision of all such Aboriginal homes, hostels or reserves be entrusted to educated Aboriginal possessing the requisite ability of such management. And here importantly, which we're going to go on to discuss a little bit more later on, that the control of Aboriginal affairs, apart from common law rights, rights shall be vested in a board of management comprised of capable, educated under Aboriginals under a chairman to be appointed by the government. That's the Commonwealth Government. They wanted the protection boards completely abolished and state control taken away and for Aboriginal affairs to sit under the Commonwealth Government, a board the voice of parliament being up in 1927. Now the board dismissed this. I mean, I, oh, that's also my grandfather's dictionary. He ca had a large dictionary that would improve his vocabulary and his understanding of English. I interviewed an old elder 30 years ago who as a kid met my grandfather and he said, oh, your grandfather had a great command of the English language, but he was good in his own tongue too. 
you know, and he was from Bellbrook up on the north coast who said that, but he, he had this dictionary which the family um, may, retains. What was the response of the state government and the Protection Board in New South Wales? Completely dismissed this and said they were well caring for the Aboriginal people and communities. And these people, a lot of ratbags basically, who needed to be dismissed and ignored, troublemakers. My grandfather responded with a three-page letter to Jack Lang and the New South Wales state government in 1927. I won't read out the entire three pages, but I think it is covered here, the power of that letter. And he said, I wish to make it perfectly clear on behalf of our people that we accept no condition of inferiority as compared with the European people. Two distinct civilizations are represented by their respective races. That the European people, by the art of war, destroyed our more ancient civilization is freely admitted and that by their vices and diseases our people have been decimated is also patent. But neither of these facts are evidence of superiority. Quite the contrary is the case. The members of the AAPA have also noted the strenuous efforts of the trade union leaders to attain the conditions which existed in our country at the time of invasion by Europeans. The men only work when necessary. We called no man master and we had no king. And I mean, the use of the word invasion in 1927, and people even dispute that today. Oh, that was led by a lot of white radical academics in the 70s using the word invasion and massacres and all that stuff. My grandfather powerfully covered that in 1927. Now, the AAPA continued on with a huge media um, blitz to embarrass all sections of the government, to particularly the Protection Board over the treatment of Aboriginal people. And um, they had established a really uh, wide network of, um, across the state. There was no phones then for Aboriginal people to make contact with or even to travel that distance down here. But news was passed through this network and would find its way to Sydney. The old fellow I said I interviewed before, he said up at Bellbrook, the community up there would get word that your grandfather was around. He wasn't allowed to go on to reserves. They said he was trying to incite revolt. So he was barred. But they knew and they'd get messages and pieces of information to the kids and send them off and they'd sneak off. And Al Reuben said, we'd go along the river there. And he said, there was a bridge. And sure enough, your grandfather would be sitting there. And he said, he'd talk to us kids and he'd inspire us and lift us up. And he said, we'd give him letters and things that were happening, which he then used in the press. And they received letters from Aboriginal families and communities on the, their predicament. One of these letters received in 1927 was in regards to the plight of a young Aboriginal girl. This is one of the saddest letters. I mean, every time I even talk about it, I get moved by this particular letter. It's in the New South Wales State Archives. It's a three-page letter that he wrote back to this girl. He was informed that this young girl, Aboriginal girl, 14 years of age, had been re raped repeatedly by the guy in charge of the station where she'd been placed. Within nine months, she was pregnant. The protection board, who held power over her, insisted that she would be put on a train and sent to Sydney, where she had the baby. The records say that the baby died in childbirth. We're not to know that. The baby may well have just been removed and then, you know, doled out into the non-Indigenous community. What did the protection board do then? They put that same girl back on the train and sent her straight back to the places of abuse. Now, when my grandfather got news of this, um, this girl's plight, he wrote her a letter. Three-page letter again. This is only a small section of it. My darling little sister, I'm speaking to you now as a big bro. My heart is filled with regret and disgust as you were taken down by those who were supposed to be your guide through life. I may tell you, and listen, girlie, your case is one in dozens with our girls. More is the pity. God forbid these white robbers of our women's virtues seem to do just as they like with downright impunity. And mind you, my dear girl, the law stands for it. He wanted the girl 
to give him the details of the guy's name and he said, I'll see this person in court. She never received the letter. The guy opened the letter from my grandfather and he sent that back to the protection board. See what's going on here? You've got to stop this. These people are a problem. And the intimidations of my grandfather and the other Aboriginal activists at this time. Can you believe this? This was a guy trying to defend what an assault upon a young Aboriginal girl and abuse. And they take the defence of the perpetrator. It's just horrific. Um, an interview with my grandfather in 1927 highlights the levels of these threats against him. And so he's sent into slavery. This is 1927, this letter. And he said he had been warned on many occasions that the doors of Long Bay Jail were opening for him and he would cheerfully go to jail for the remainder of his life, he declared, if by so doing he could make the people of Australia realise the truly frightful administration of the Aborigines Act. The AAPA were eventually hounded out of existence in 1929 by the police acting for the board. They were driven into being an underground movement and there were threats against my grandfather's family and Sid Ridgway's family and Tom Lacey's family, the Aboriginal activists, with their own kids. But they didn't stop, you know. My grandfather, the old fellow that I said I interviewed, eventually as a teenager had come to Sydney and was working as a groundkeeper at the University of Sydney. And he said, in the mid-30s, the last time I saw your grandfather speak, he said he got up on a box within the grounds of the University of Sydney and was speaking out. So he was still active at that particular point. Now, the legacy and historical truth of the AAPA and its political platform all those years ago continues to resonate today. When one reads the Uluru Statement of the Heart, it is important that we recognise this is not a new directive. It is, in fact, reflects nearly a century of similar demands by Aboriginal people for rights and recognition. The Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association raised several critical elements embedded in the Uluru Statement during the 1920s. And these Aboriginal people to be placed in charge of their own lives, genuine Aboriginal self-determination, and an Aboriginal board to sit under the Commonwealth Government. Those three important points are covered in the um, Uluru Statement of the past. And when we look back at those points, um, you can read that in the manifestos and speeches and correspondence of the AAPA leadership. And as I said, they were stating the same things. And at that opening um, conference in Sydney in 1925, my grandfather said there, we want to be in charge of our own destiny. That is in the Uluru Statement of the Heart. Back at that first ever uh, convention at St David's Church and Hall in Surrey Hills, 200 Aboriginal people attended that conference and they were front page news with banners, Aborigines demand self-determination and self-determination is their aim. This is 50 years before the Whitlam government accredited with putting up self-determination for Aboriginal people. Aboriginal people made that demand in 1925. And finally, back in 1927, as I've mentioned before, the AAPA manifesto clearly demanded that the control of Aboriginal affairs, apart from common law rights, shall be vested in a board of management comprised of capable, educated Aboriginals under a chairman to be appointed by the government. So the truth is the call for the voice to Parliament has been a very long one. Stepping along here. Now, I've been researching my grandfather and the organisation he formed um, for more than 30 years. And as I said before, it, it amazes me that more and more material continues to come to light. Only in recent months, an article found through the National Library of Australia's magnificent trove newspaper. I've got to keep giving that a bit of a prop up. Thankfully, the Commonwealth Government finally funded it again because it looked like it was going to go. Um, and if you do get the chance to go on to Trove, I mean, it's so addictive you can't stop. <laughs> I'm up till two in the morning. <laughs> now, an article published in the Sydney Labor Daily on Saturday the 2nd of February 1929 stated the two Aboriginal speakers would put their case forward for Aboriginal political reform. Yep. It revealed that on the following Tuesday evening at the School of Arts in Chatswood, 
Um, the president of the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association, Mr Fred Maynard, accompanied by another Aboriginal speaker, would address the members of the Chatswood Willoughby Labor League on Aboriginal matters generally. My grandfather was described as a forceful, logical speaker who would explain some of the disadvantages under which his people labour. It was further revealed that there was a move to establish an association of white Australians to assist with a push to have an Aboriginal represent his people in federal parliament. Or failing that, have an Aboriginal ambassador appointed to live in Canberra to watch over his people's interests and advise the federal authorities. This is a remarkable find and reveals the strong sentiment nearly 100 years ago pushing for an Aboriginal voice in Parliament. I sadly never met my grandfather. He died eight years before I was born. I mean, a wharf labourer, the stories in my family say that he had an accident on the wharf. But there's certainly some, um, how can you say, considerations that say that it was no accident to what happened to him on the wharf. But one leg was broken in six places. Uh, he spent nearly 12 months in and out of hospital. His injuries were so severe. He contracted sugar diabetes, um, gangrene. His legs were removed. And from that point, it was a very hard life for the family. My grandmother was a white woman. And for a white woman to marry an Aboriginal man in 1928 was not the done thing in this country, let alone in a city like Sydney. She wasn't from a well-to-do family or even a middle-class white family. She was from a poor white mining family. She was a single mother when she met my grandfather. But they loved one another and they had four children together. Um, but after the, the accident, they were on two pounds a fortnight from St Vincent's to Paul to assist with the family. There were no pensions or anything like that and certainly no insurances to cover what had happened um, to the family. Um, and as I said, it was a very hard life for the family from that point on and my, my grandfather passed away and it's really due to the strength of my grandmother that she kept the kids you know, together and ongoing and protected them. And my father went on to be a top jockey. Um, he even met the Queen. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> in the contemporary setting, we need to mobilise support like never before in embracing the Uluru Statement of the Heart and its ideals of finally seeking to heal from the past and provide a platform that is just and equitable for all Australians. The legacy and memory of the AAPA, its membership and its supporters nearly 100 years ago provides a clear message from the past that this recognition and truth is long, long overdue. And a little bit of shameless promotion. Uh, my book, Fight for Liberty and Freedom, I'm actually working on a revised edition of this because next year will be 100 years since the AAPA formed. And um, I want to bring that up to date with material because this book came out in 2007. It was, it was a finalist for the Victorian Premier's History Award and uh, a number of other awards at the time and has been really well sought after. I get people from America, United States, the African American Studies Centre and Native American Studies Centre who use the book in their teaching as well. And interesting enough, in 2016, the book was translated and published in China as well, which I take as a, um, with great pride. But uh, thank you very much for having me here tonight, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. <laughs>